Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Would you bow your heads and would you pray with me? Lord God, I pray that the words I'm about to speak and the thoughts that we think as we meditate on your word for us today, Lord, I pray that would all be truly acceptable in your sight, O God, who is indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So uh, I know this guy who grew up believing that there were monsters under his bed and in his closet. Uh, so much so that he had trouble sleeping at night, his, was driving his parents crazy. Finally, his dad uh, got an idea. It was kind of genius. He, uh, he took a can of just ordinary Glade air freshener spray. That's, uh, that's what this is. And, uh, and he put the words monster spray on it. And uh, he gave it to his son, and he told his son that this uh, spray was very, very effective at dealing with monsters. All he had to do was give it a little spray in the closet and under his bed, and he wouldn't have to worry about monsters for that whole night. It would last the whole night. It would keep the monsters away. And so his son bought it. He, 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 he thought that was great, and he, and he took the spray, and, and when he needed to, when he was afraid, he would spray it in the closet. He'd spray it under his bed, and, and then he could go to sleep. Now, now, eventually, he didn't need the monster spray anymore. But as we talked about it, he, he was honest with me. He said, you know, there was always this little part of me, this little voice in the back of my head that knew this was just air freshener. But, but he said, I never really let that little voice have it say. I never really let it out. I, I let myself believe that the monster spray really worked. And then I didn't have to be afraid. So here's my question for you. Is that what your faith in God is really like? Is, is your faith in God just something that somebody made up that you really like because it helps keep the fear away? It helps you believe that there's somebody up in the sky that cares for you and, and that you don't have to be afraid of dying because God's going to bring you to heaven. And, and there's really this little voice in the back of your head going, ah, I don't know if all this stuff's true or not. It doesn't really matter. But you don't really let that voice have its say because you kind of like the idea that you don't have to be afraid. See, I think a lot of people think about faith in God that way. I think a lot of us think that, that our faith is, is, a, is a really nice thing to hold on to, and, and so we, we let ourselves hang on to it. But, but I think there's a part of us that just thinks that it might all be made up and there really isn't a lot of evidence for what we believe. Well, if that's where you're at, this week's for you. Because, you see, this week we are taking a look at the Gospel of Luke. And Luke begins his Gospel with these words. He says, Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. He's talking about Jesus' life what Jesus did, how Jesus died, how he rose again from the dead. He says, they used the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I also, Luke writes, have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so that you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Luke's writing to a fellow believer. In fact, the name Theophilus literally means lover of God. He, he's writing to a, a fellow believer. And whether that was a real person or whether that was a symbolic person, we don't know. And honestly, it doesn't matter. Luke is writing to say, if, if your faith is like monster spray, I've got news for you. I've talked to the eyewitnesses. I've studied the accounts. And I believe that you can be certain of what you were taught, that it's more than just something hopeful to cling to, but it's something we can believe in, not only with our heart, but with our head, with integrity. Now, that's different than some of the other gospel writers, isn't it? In fact, next week, we're going to conclude this Four Witnesses series by studying the Gospel of John. And, and, and John literally says this. He says, these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have faith or, or have life in his name. John's talking about believing. He's talking about faith. But again, look at that last line of Luke's introduction. He says he wants us to be certain of the truth of everything we've been taught. For Luke, it's more than just 
Faith is some sort of nebulous idea without any basis in fact. Luke is going to teach us, and that's why we're calling him the journalist. Luke is going to teach us how that by study, we can come to a faith that's built in, in, in some very reasonable evidence for our faith. Now, who exactly is Luke? Well, first of all, you probably already know this. He's not one of the 12 disciples. He's not an eyewitness to a lot of the things he writes about in his gospel. Rather, he, he was a, a follower of the Apostle Paul. He had learned the things about Jesus from Paul. But, but church history tells us that, that Luke did more than just listen to Paul. He, as he says in the beginning, talked to a lot of eyewitnesses, including, we believe, Mary. That's why Luke's story of the birth of Jesus is so rich in detail, even down to the details of Mary saying that she was pondering things in her heart. Uh, we believe Luke also spent time with Peter, the disciple Peter, and hearing the stories about Jesus from Peter's perspective. It's maybe why Peter never wrote a gospel, because Luke had written a lot of it down for him. But first and foremost, we know that Luke was a very educated man. He was a doctor. He was a rational man, a, a thinking man, a, a, a Gentile, a Greek who believed in logic and believed in evidence. And so when Luke writes his gospel, he's writing to set Jesus in a historic time and, and to share with us um, real facts about the life of Jesus in such a way that, that we can see that this isn't, these aren't just made-up stories. I mean, take a look at the beginning of uh, Luke chapter 2, that, that very famous thing that we read every year at Christmas time, that account of the birth of Jesus. It starts with these words, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Notice how Luke sets Jesus' birth in a specific historic context, one that we can verify, by the way. Now, of course, you've heard of Caesar Augustus. Everybody has a, a great leader in, in the early Roman Empire. But, but Luke doesn't just stop there. He, he throws in this the idea that there was this census, this registration, and there was this guy named Quirinius who was governor there in Syria. And by the way, we know from lots of different Roman documents that Quirinius was a real person. His full name was Publius Sup Suspic Sulpicius. He's got a hard name to pronounce. Uh, Quirinius, and we know he was born in 51 BC. Uh, we know he died a relatively old man for those days in 21 AD. As I said, he's mentioned many times in many different Roman documents and histories. We've actually, archaeologists have found some coins minted in his name there in Syria, where Luke puts him as um, a governor. And uh, there's even an inscription found uh, about a Roman officer who said that this Roman officer, by order of Quirinius, conducted a census um, in the city of, uh, of Apamea. So, so again, this Quirinus was a real person. We, we know he was born in Lanuvium, a, a small town, a Latin town near Rome. We know he had two different wives, both of which he divorced, one named Appia and another named Amelia. We know that he didn't have any children with either of those wives, and we even have an account, a public account of his funeral when he died. This is a real guy. And, and Luke throws his name in the gospel not because it has theological significance, but because it has historic significance. He's, he's trying to root these stories in history and by doing so show us that, that these are true stories. Another example of this is just a chapter later in Luke chapter 3. He, he begins this chapter with these words, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, so a new Caesar now in place, and we know when that transition took place from Caesar Augustus to Tiberius, he says, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Now, by the way, that's the kind of reading that scares lay readers from wanting to read on a Sunday morning in church, doesn't it? A lot of big names in there. But again, what Luke is doing is not trying to make it hard to read. He's rooting these stories about Jesus in history. Now, now, by the way, this particular list is pretty interesting. We, we've got lots of, to document about Tiberius and uh, even Herod and Philip and, uh, and Lysanias and uh, Annas and Caiaphas, the high priest. We've got lots of historical document, uh, documentation about all of them. 
Uh, interestingly enough, the one that we didn't have a whole lot of documentation about is Pontius Pilate. It feels, figures very prominently, not just in Luke's gospel, but in the others. But we have no idea when he was born or when he died. It's not, he's not written about much in, in Roman documents. We don't know where he was born. We, we really don't know a whole lot about him. And in fact, that led some scholars to, to question the accuracy of Luke and the other gospels. You know, since they couldn't find evidence of Pontius Pilate existing in history. Now, interestingly enough, there's lots of evidence about all the other guys Luke mentioned, but because there wasn't about this one, there were questions about the accuracy of Luke's gospel. And then in the 1960s, they were uh, re, uh, rebuilding an amphitheater in a place called Caesarea Maritima there in Israel. And as they were rebuilding that amphitheater, they found that old stones had been used to reconstruct it at another time in the past. And one of those old stones bore this inscription on it, uh, Tiberium Pontius Pilatus, Prefect of Judea. In other words, that earlier version of this amphitheater had been built and dedicated in the name of Pontius Pilate, who was indeed the Roman governor there in this area in Judea, where, right where Luke puts him. Historians had to admit, yeah, obviously Pontius Pilate did exist, and maybe he did something wrong that caused Roman historians to, to kind of wipe his name out of their records. But he was a real person, set in a real time, again, that Luke demonstrates. Now, Luke doesn't just root the stories of Jesus in a specific history and in a specific time to, to lend credibility to them, to help us see that there, there's evidence these stories are true. He also, in how he tells the stories about Jesus, continues to go back to this idea that Jesus predicted how he was going to die, that he was going to be crucified, and predicted that, that he was going to be buried, and predicted that he would rise from the dead. In uh, Luke chapter 18, it says this, Jesus is uh, taking the 12 and he says to them, See, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the Son of Man and the prophets will be accomplished. For he, he's talking about himself, will be delivered over to the Gentiles and, they, and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. But on the third day, he will rise. Luke tells us that when Jesus told him this, it, 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 they didn't really understand what he was trying to tell them. They didn't understand that he was literally predicting the method of his death and that he was going to rise again. Now, now by the way, in my uh, English Standard Version Bible, this particular section in Luke 18 has a heading above it, and that heading says, Jesus predicts his death for the third time. This is the third time in Luke's Gospel that, that Luke points out that Jesus told the disciples exactly what was going to happen to him, and that it did. Later in Luke chapter 24, Luke tells us the stories that he was told by those eyewitnesses. How they not only had heard Jesus predict his own death, but they saw the resurrected Jesus. That we celebrate on Easter and during this Easter season that Jesus did indeed rise from the, again from the dead exactly as he had promised. It says this in Luke 24, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Remember how it said they, they couldn't understand what Jesus was talking about? Well, now they do. And said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. Luke tells us that not only did they finally understand what Jesus was talking about when they saw him literally do what he had said, rise from the dead, but that they became his witnesses, starting there in Jerusalem and spreading out through the known world. And when Luke is writing, those witnesses are still around to talk to. Luke himself talked to them. He interviewed them. He heard from them the truth of the resurrection. And he writes his account so that we too, through Luke, can hear these eyewitness accounts as well. Now, Luke's gospel is, of course, more than just um, these predictions about Jesus and these historical events to try to, to root these stories about Jesus in, in history and in logic. Luke's gospel has some of the most beautiful parables of Jesus, and, and I hope that as you read Luke's gospel this week, you'll, you'll hear some of the great teaching there. I love Luke chapter 15. Three of my favorite parables, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, the, the prodigal son. Uh, 
Luke also talks about these amazing miracles that Jesus did. One of the miracles that appears only in Luke's gospel um, is in Luke chapter 7, where he tells us about the story of this widow from a village named Nain and how Jesus is heading into the village and she's coming out with her son to bury him, her only son. She's lost her husband, she's a widow, and now she's lost her son too. And by losing these two important men in her life, she's lost status in the city. Her life is gonna be a mess. And Jesus, we're told, raises that son from the dead. An amazing miracle and an amazing act of compassion for this woman giving her back her son. Now, now by the way, when Luke tells us that story, notice he again roots it in a real place. This is a widow from Nain. And by the way, you can go to Nain today if you want. I mean, probably not today, but uh, when you can travel internationally again, you can go to Israel and there's an Arab village in the north of Israel, not far from Nazareth. It's Nain. It's still there today. There's one more parable, though, that, that I want to make sure we don't miss. One, one story in Luke's gospel, again, only in Luke's gospel. And in this, I think Luke is trying to make sure that we as the readers of his gospel think about our own faith and where we're at. Jesus tells the story of a rich man and a poor man named Lazarus who um, both have died and one is in heaven and one is in hell. And I don't need to get into necessarily the whole details of the parable or what Jesus was trying to teach. But at the very end of the parable, this rich man who's in hell asks Father Abraham in heaven, with whom he's having this conversation, to do something for him. He, he, says, he says, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus uh, to my father's house. He's got brothers that are still alive that, that don't understand about God and faith and what they're supposed to be doing and, and, and how they're supposed to live their lives. And, and he says, send them to my father's house so that he can warn them. And Abraham says they have Moses and the prophets. In other words, he says they have the scriptures. They have these written accounts from God. And that should be enough to help them understand how life is supposed to work. But he says, no, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, in other words, he says, if somebody comes back from the dead, if Lazarus comes back from the dead, then they will believe, then they will repent. But in this parable that Luke recounts for us, notice what Father Abraham says. He says, if they don't pay attention to Moses and the prophets, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Folks, I think what Luke is trying to tell us as the readers of this gospel is that this account he's given us should be enough for us to believe that our faith is more than just believing in fairy tales. That, that Jesus was a real person um, and his, his birth and his death are, are rooted in real places in real time. And, and there are plenty of witnesses that Lucas talked to that have told the tale about how that Jesus didn't stay dead but rose from the dead. But, but Luke is saying, even if you saw Jesus right here today, would that really convince you if you don't believe what I've written? Or can you believe that Jesus is exactly who he said he is? And that our, our faith isn't just some crazy thing that somebody dreamed up to make us be able to sleep well at night. But our faith is rooted in a real person, in, in real time, in a real place, who really died and who really rose and who has really promised to you and me that through him we can receive forgiveness for our sins, that our relationship with God is restored, and we can have life forever with him. You know, one last story. In, uh, in the 1970s here in Chicago area, there was this guy named Lee Strobel. He had gone to Yale Law School. Uh, he was a reporter for the Chicago Tribune. He had even received a very prestigious um, editor's award in 1980 for the work that he had done uh, about a, um, an investigative report into uh, how uh, the Ford Pinto was uh, not safe and had caused deaths and some accidents. Now, Strobel had a problem. The problem was he was an atheist. He didn't believe in God, but his wife had started going to church. 
she'd gone to Willow Creek, a, a church here in the Chicago area, out in the Barrington area, and uh, and she had become a believer. She believed that that all these stories about Jesus were real, and that he was her savior. And for Strobel, that was a problem because you see, he and his wife had always kind of made fun of Christians a little better, looked down their nose at them, and believed that uh, it was kind of like believing in monster spray. So. Strobel, as an investigative reporter, that decided what he was going to do is he was going to use those investigative reporting skills that he had to, to look into these stories about Jesus and, and to prove to his wife and to himself that it was all a bunch of baloney. But you know what happened? The more Strobel investigated, the more he came to believe that there really was something to this that Jesus was a real historical person, that there was no doubt about that, that 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 real historical person lived in a specific place in a specific time, and, and that the evidence that that Jesus had not only died at the hands of the Romans, but risen from the dead, was very real indeed. One day he, he gathered his coworkers at the Tribune around the water cooler, and he said, I got something to tell you guys. I, I've become a Christian. I, I believe it's all real pretty amazing story. He, Lee Strobel became a pastor. He, he writes books about his journey to faith. Folks, our faith doesn't have to be make-believe or, or, or a wish that we hope is true. We have Luke's gospel, and, and Luke has written so that through the eyewitnesses' accounts and the stories that he's told as a result of those interviews he did with all those eyewitnesses, that he can present to us something so that we can be certain about the things that we've been taught. I pray that this week you would read Luke's gospel and that you would find in the pages of the gospel a God that loves you dearly, really and truly. Amen.